Okay. Well, um, so my name is Josh Whiteley and I'm here with Jessica Richmond, who is a longtime friend and colleague of mine. I've known her going back. We were just talking maybe 15 years or so. So it's been a really long time. Um, I know Jessica through um, studying Ayurveda. Um, we've studied with some similar teachers and we actually at one point ended up working at a center together doing treatments and consultations. So it's very fun to have her here to chat with. Um, she's doing some really neat stuff and I'm excited to share that with you and ask a bunch of questions I have. And hopefully um, you guys appreciate it. And um, if anybody is here and wants to ask some questions, I'll try to keep an eye on the Facebook tab as well so we can get some questions and maybe closer to the end or something. But um, so, hey, Jesse. Hi. <laughs> um, nice I'm happy. I'm happy to have you here. Um, you're in Vrindavan, yes? Vrindavan, India. Um, yeah, okay. And you were just telling me it's very, very hot and dry there right now, right? Yeah. It was 115 degrees yesterday, and the low is 94 at night. <laughs> like, really hot. Hot and dry. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, so I, I'll just start off, um, actually, why don't you start off by just letting people who don't know who you are, maybe just a little bit about your history. Um, I'm particularly curious how you got involved in, um, in doing Vedic psychology and what led you down that road, but also what led you uh, into Western psychology and just kind of what your path in general is. I'm curious. Okay. Well, thank you for having me, and I'm excited to be on this interview and to meet people, new people, your friends and your clients. Um, my background is I'm, I'm a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Florida. And before that, years before that, when we were friends, I was an Ayurvedic practitioner. I went to the Kripalu School of Ayurveda and I was practicing in um, Colorado. And that's where we met and worked at the, at the yoga center. And we did Ayurveda and Panchakarma. Um, and then what happened was when I was seeing my clients for psychotherapy, I was using my Ayurvedic practice and my psychotherapy practice, but there was still something that was missing because a lot of times it's hard to get to the root cause of the problem, you know? And so when I learned about Vedic psychology and how that could be <clears throat> applied, I got into it. I came and studied here in India from a guru. Um, but we call him Babaji, but his full name is Dr. Satyanarayana Dasa. Um, and he taught me this, these approaches of getting to the root cause of the problem in the mind. And it helped my practice go a lot deeper with my clients to really figure out what it actually is that's bothering them. Uh, oftentimes I have clients in relationship issues, you know, they've had a bad breakup or they have a, they're in a bad, a really painful relationship. It doesn't even have to be with a romantic partner. It could be with a mother or a father or a child. And so oftentimes, you know, in therapy, what you say is, you know, behaviorally had a change or change your thoughts about the person or about the situation and then change your behavior, you know? But that doesn't change actually where the problem's coming from. There's a root, just like in Ayurveda, that we love to find the root cause of the problem. Just like if 10 people come in with a headache, you know, you don't give them all the same thing. You know, one person it could be because of a, you know, hormonal issue and another person it could be migraines, another person could be because they got hit in the head. So the same thing with mental, you know? It, you know, if you're showing up and you're having a difficult relation, I don't tell everybody the same thing. Oh, you should just, you know, try to understand the person better or you should work on your communication skills. I ask why. Why is the difficult relation happening? And it's not about the other person. What within you is making you attracted to somebody that hurts you? Mm -hmm. What is within you that makes you think you're not good enough? You know, and that, that comes from the childhood, from your relationship with your parents. So that's what I'm going for. That's, that's, and that's why I love this work, to really get to the root of the problem and solve it once and for all. And is that something you feel like you picked up studying with your guru more specifically than you did in your, in your more Western training? Yes. In the Western training, most, most of the time I'm using cognitive behavioral therapy, which is like, okay, so what is, what's that faulty thinking that you have? It's not working for you. Let's work on the, your thoughts and try to change something about how you're thinking. You, have, you might have a negative filter about how you look at the world. You may have black and white thinking, like this person's in, this person's out. When most people are gray, they've got some in and some out, right? Um, so I, I work on the thinking level and on the behavior level. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, let's try to think how we can change your behavior. 
but that does not have to do with actually what my guru taught me, which is why are they doing that behavior? And why are they thinking that way? They were not born out of the womb thinking in that way mm. and acting that way. They got a program put in them at childhood that made them think in this way or act in this way. So it's almost like, it's almost like, a, like you said, like a programming that, that, that sort of happens. So I guess in what you're trying to do is, I don't know if deprogram is the right word, but it, yeah. it is, okay. And reprogram to, to new yep. programs that maybe you would or be more helpful for you to be happy and have fulfilling relationships and that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. And the deprogramming is what we're doing is deprogramming them of their pattern or their program. But the hardest part is the, the program in all of us the programs we have, we're not aware of. Mm. It's not that you walk into therapy and you're like, Oh, I typically, you know, uh, pick people who hate me and treat me like crap. That's, you know, usually we come in and say, this person is such a jerk. I think I need to get a new partner who's nicer. Instead of realizing what is it within me that makes me believe that I deserve somebody that treats me like crap. Right. So to depro deprogram is very hard. It's very hard because it's your, it's your baseline of what you think is normal. The way that you act in life, you think is normal and, and fine and healthy. You think the problem's with the other person. Right, right. So, so it's a lot of introspective work and sort of trying to change essentially your own patterning and the way that you approach other people rather than looking to say like, oh, why, you know, why are people always mean to me? Or, yeah. you know, why do I always attract these jerks who do X, Y, Z, right? Yes. Okay, okay. It's really hard because oftentimes what happens is in the, the Vedic psychology approach, uh, we have something called our ahankara, which is our identity, like who we think we are. Our ahankara is like, um, I think I'm a nice person. So why, do I, why would I, me, the nice guy or the nice girl, why do I deserve these people who are mean and hateful to me? I'm nice. And we also all think that we're pretty smart. You know, so I, I pick good people and I'm a nice person. That's what everybody thinks. Right. So to get beyond that, that your identity of who you think you are and say, okay, it's true, you are nice and you do pick good people, but you have this program in you that makes you pick people that aren't good for you and that makes you act in ways that maybe aren't so nice sometimes. Maybe not mean, but maybe very passively kind of controlling, but you don't even realize it. So it's, it's really hard to look at yourself by yourself. You need a guide on the outside to teach you the parts of your mind and how they're operating to keep you stuck. And so that's another difference between Vedic psychology and Western psychology. In, in Vedic psychology, what, what you do is you, you, you're learning about your mind, just like in Ayurveda. You don't just, you know, especially in the West, if a client comes, you educate. You say, okay, you're the pitta types, you've got to take cooling things, something like that, right? So in Vedic psychology, we say, okay, your ahankara is doing this. So you see how it's blocking you? Okay, and your samskara, which is the program in you and your unconscious mind that you're not aware of, your samskar, look at, let's identify which samskar it is. Oh, it's that program. Oh, the I'm not good enough program's running. So we teach you about your mind. So when you're all done with this type of therapy, you know yourself. You know the different parts of your mind and what they're doing. And you can then manage and control your own mind because you know what's happening. Just like when you're learning how to drive a car, you don't just get, get a car. You have to take classes to get your license, right? And then you get your license, which means I know how to drive a car and I know the rules of the road. So that's how we teach Vedic psychology, mm. teaching you about your mind, which you can't see, you know? And that's also one of the, the big barriers with this is that we all think we know, you know, because it's invisible, you can't see it. So we all think we know. Right. It's a little bit easier to work with the body and you say, you know, your knee is broken. You broke your knee. And then they're like, oh my God, it's really hurting. So of course I broke my knee, yes. But with the mind, we're so used to it. It's so subtle and we're so used to it. It's like our breath. We just take it for granted. So what you have in you, your po programs and your pattern, patterns, you think that that's normal and fine. So to point it out and say, yeah, that's not, that one's not fine. That's hurting you. Right. Oh. So, so it's almost like, you know, and I think of this a lot, uh, including with myself, you know, I feel like we have these sort of blind spots to these places within ourselves that we're yeah. either unable or unwilling to look at, but either way we can't see them and therefore we don't think they exist. Yes. And, and, and what is that coming from? Why do, why do we do that? 
That's a good question. So there's a couple parts to it. So one of them is that ahankara, right? Your sense of self. So the ahankara, the, the characteristics and the nature of it, which is not like the, it's natural and normal, just like pitta runs hot. But that's it's just nature. So the nature of ahankara is that we can't see our own flaws. The fact. It's not a problem. It's not a defect. That's just the nature of our ahankara, which is our sense of self. I am Josh Whiteley, and I am a good acupuncturist. So if you hear a client saying, oh, he was horrible, it just makes you allergic to that. It's like, oh, you know, because ahankara identifies with I am Josh Whiteley. I've been in practice for X number of years, and I'm a good acupuncturist. So anything that doesn't match with that doesn't work. You know, so our ahankara only can see how good we are. Mm. It, that's just clever. its function. <laughs> what? Right. I said it's very clever, right? No, it's very clever. It only can see how good we are, and it, it thrives on praise. Like the food for ahankara is praise. Mm. So when someone says, you, "Have you been to Josh? He's the best acupuncturist I've ever been to." Really, ahankara just feels. Whew. I mean, even when I uh, teach and we do group exercises, sometimes in my classes, I have them do this exercise just so you can get to know your own, your own ahankara. And what I do is I say, you write down like the three best things that would be so wonderful to hear. Just write them down on the paper and then write down the three worst things. It would be so horrible to hear. And then find a partner, switch the papers, and first do the best, read to each other and watch your ahankara. It feels so good, even though it's just an exercise and you told them to say that about you. It feels so good. And then write the things that would feel horrible and have them say it. And it feels so, I mean, ahankara gets so tripped up. It feels real. Because then you can see how ah ahankara functions, and it's going all the time. Mm. Anything that makes you feel good, yes. And anything that makes you feel bad, which would be your blind spots, you know, ahankara just shivers and shakes and will make some rationalization why that's not, not true. Right, right. So we're, I think it's how we survive in the world. Because it, actually, if your ahankara it was weaker and you could see, your blind spots or your programming that's not working for you, you could end up really depressed. Because there's some people who say, no, I, I see how bad I am in relationships and I think I suck. Those people are, will be more depressed. Right. Right? So maybe it's a way for us to be able to survive, to not see that. Right. And if you think about the nature of our self, you know, we're looking out. Our eyes are looking out. So I can see all the other people, but I don't have my eyes looking in. So you can't see your blind spots because you're not, who's walking around focusing on that? We're worried about what this person's going to think, or did I upset that person? Did I make that person happy? Or how can I make it up the corporate ladder? Whatever your thing is, you're thinking it's all external. Right. We're not designed to look in at ourselves. you know? And then one level deeper to answer this, it relates to your soul, your atma. So your soul does not, is flawless, right? It's perfect. It can't be cut. It doesn't die. It's eternal, right? So that is being superimposed onto our body. So the qualities of the soul are being superimposed onto our body and we don't realize that. And that's why we think we're perfect. Our mm -hmm. soul is perfect. But our body is not and our mind is not. But we don't see the difference. So that's also, you know, you see what I'm saying? Right, right. So what is, in, in, in Vedic psychology, how do you view the mind itself? What is the mind? What is it doing? Is it important? Is it unimportant? What, what, are, we, what are our minds doing? <laughs> okay, so our mind, there's, the, okay, our mind has four parts to it, okay? So we, we, we call mind manas. Manas is the mind, right? And that's one part. So mind in general has four parts, but manas is one part. And it's also called the mind. So that's kind of weird. But so the, in, in general, what the mind is doing is trying to feel happy, trying to avoid pain, trying to find love, right? Trying to be actually, to feel good. Not happy, but I mean good as in the ahankara being in the position of I'm, I'm good, I'm number one. Oftentimes, right? Um, so, but then you have to see what's actually really going on because all four parts of the mind are doing something. So, ahankara is always about being number one or being whatever your identity is. I'm the best father, I'm the best mother, you know, 
um, I'm, I'm good at my job. I'm very good at my job. And, I'm, and Ahankar is always comparing. I'm better than her. It's not that I'm just good. I need to be better than that person. Then I feel everything is right in the world. You know, so that's Ahankar. It's always rationalizing. That's only one piece, though. Then Manas, one other part of the mind, is where all the emotions are just playing out. Okay, so Manas is on a binary system of like and dislike. So anything you see, it's already, like, as soon as you see it, it's I like that or I don't like that. And then the whole chain of events happens with the other parts of the mind. Anything you see, anything you smell, anything that comes in through your five senses, you're automatically stamping as like or dislike before you even know what it is. Mm. Interesting. You know, it's just very quick, very automatic, right? And then your, um, your- oh, Sorry to interrupt you, but where does that come from? Why, why are we doing that? Why, or why is the mind doing that? Because the samskara, first of all, it's, it's the, some, the part that we're not aware of, our unconscious mind. So just say like, like um, I don't know how you would react to, let me find something, this. Scissors. Uh. So some people <laughs> might really like scissors. Scissors when I was younger, so I think I have automatic dislike. <laughs> okay, you see what I'm saying? So what'd you say you did when you were younger with them? I stepped on a pair of scissors and they broke oh. my foot. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. So this is a, a trigger for you. So it's dislike automatically. Why was it so automatic? Why? Because you have a memory in your un unconscious mind that gets pulled up into your conscious mind called manas. Unconscious mind is called chitta. Okay. So in your chitta, you have what's called a samskara, a memory file of stepping on a pair of scissors in incredible pain. So dislike, you know, it gets, it gets, when you see something similar now, all these years later, you're like, oh God, right? Scissors. And, and up comes the samskara onto the consciousness of your mind, the manas. And you feel, oh my God, like whatever feelings happen, there could be pain, there could be fear, right? So whatever those feelings are come up and then you say, oh, I really don't like that. So it's not random what you don't like. It's not random. It's actually coming from the past. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I was born with a fear of um, needles pretty much. I don't have a memory of why. It's not like, you know what I mean? But it could be either something happened when I was really young and I don't remember about needles, injections or anything with needles, like you know, <laughs> when, I, when you gave me acupuncture, right? Like I have a real fear of needles. Or, or it could have happened in a past life. It could be a vasana, like a latent tendency, kind of a tendency. Who knows maybe what happened in the past life with needles at me. But there's something that came through that from a very young age, with anything with needles or even blood. I was really young, like three years old, the first time I fainted when I saw blood. A little boy in my nursery school cut his head and I fainted. I was three. So where does that come from? It's not that I had some tra trauma in the first few years of my life. So that's coming from the past. I must have had a gory life with needles and blood, you know? And so what happens is it, when you see something with your senses, you know, the, so you see the scissors or I'd see a needle, you know, what happens is automatically whatever matches that experience, our booty, which is the fourth part of our mind, our intelligence or what we call our awareness, searches like a searchlight searching through our chitta, which is our unconscious mind, which I talk about like as a basement, searching for a matching file. And it goes, oh, ding, 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 scissors. Yes, we have a memory with scissors and it pulls up that memory. This is all happening in like a nanosecond. It pulls up that memory onto manas and you have a reaction. Hmm. So that's, ha that's happening all the time, all the time. It's just that most of our memories are pretty benign. Most of our memory files and our chitta are pretty benign. So our reactions are, if we don't have trauma, you know? Right. Our reactions are kind of neutral, you know? So are we, are, are we essentially trying to break that process? Are we trying to you know, kind of interject ourselves in some way before that, you know, chain of events goes on in our mind or, you know, do, like, so for instance, using your scissors example, I mean, do I want to try to stop, you know, my association with scissors as being something bad or is it just something to notice or like, like how, how would you work with these things, I guess, and in the bigger context of therapy, you know, when it gets to be more, uh, um, you know, traumatic life issues or, or some scars and things like that, like how, how do you, how do you interject yourself in that or is that what, is that even the goal? Yeah, that's a good question. That's, that's the goal. The goal is you don't want to be triggered by any of these things. Why? Because don't we all want to be enlightened, liberated from all of that and free? So nobody wants to feel traumatized by something that happened 10 or 20 or 30 years ago or even one year ago, right? We want to be peaceful. 
the actual natural state of our mind is in sattva. Not, we don't really know that because most of the time we're feeling something. Will you, will you just, for, there's probably some people who don't know what that means. What is, what well, is, describe peaceful. sattva? The natural state of our mind is peaceful. Hmm. Like if you see a baby who's just happy and smiling, and that's us, that's how we were. But some, lots of things happened that created all these undigested memories in our unconscious mind that get triggered up all the time. You know, so the goal, the question is, what's the goal? Is that if something's bothering you in your life, if something's not working for you, our goal would be to raise your awareness about that so you can, like you said, interject. And it's not just stop it, because if you just stop it, it's going to come the next time, and it's going to come the next time, right? So there's two steps. One is in the moment, you want to raise your awareness so you can be aware of it and go, oh my God, I'm doing that thing again. I'm making myself really small and like a, you know, like self-deprecating around um, people in romantic relationships, right? I'm making myself really small, like unworthy. You know, that's that program again. Shoot, I just did it again. So then you stop yourself. But next day when you see that same person again, you're going to do it again because the program is there and the program matches. So like for me, I had a very critical father growing up. He was very smart, but he was also very critical of me. And so I took in these programs that I'm not good enough, that I better keep quiet around him. I better not say what I think or what I need or what I feel, you know, and that there's something wrong with me and that I'm stupid. That's what I believed about myself. So because of that, as an adult, when I would get in a romantic relationship with a man, and not even that, even just any man who's an authority figure to me, okay, that those some scars in me, those programs, would get triggered up onto that man because he resembled my father. My father was the man in authority, right? So any man I was with, whether it's a boyfriend or a husband or <clears throat> my um, professor or my boss, I would all of a sudden act small, like I wouldn't say anything, I'd be like shy, I would be completely nervous about like, should I say what I think or should I say what I need? And it got extreme. You know, I would really just go back to that childhood state again, right? Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. Because the samskara does not change. So that childhood state, when that triggers up, you go back to the age that you were like a little girl, shy, scared, nervous, you know, and then my body's aging. The samskara doesn't age. Right. So every time I get into that position, it gets triggered right. up. So in terms of how to work with what you said, how do you stop it or what's the goal? The goal would be that I could be peaceful around anybody. Why should I be upset? Why should I change my personality around different people? I should always want to, I should always be able to be peaceful, right? So then what I do with my clients is I create something called an awareness meter, where like for me, it could be like how I act around men, you know? So it could be how I act around men awareness meter. And we put it on a spectrum, like, you know, on a continuum going from zero to 10. How do I act when I'm zero? That's like when I'm not around any guy. Peaceful, loving, happy, confident. Oops, now I'm around a guy. So what am I at at a three? How do I start bringing myself down? What happens when I'm at a five? What happens at a seven and a 10? So I go the whole way up. And that's how you can raise your awareness. Because then you use that meter to catch yourself and go, oops, I'm at a five. What do I need to do to bring myself back down? So that takes a lot of work to catch it. But the goal is, so remember I was saying there's two steps. One is to use your awareness to catch it and stop it. But the other one is to get rid of the root cause. That's just dealing with it in the, in the moment so you don't suffer so much. But, it, but like I said, it keeps coming back. So how you deal with the root cause is you have to do some deep work around talking about those memories in therapy. You have to process them. Because those memories, when they got put in you, you were little. And you weren't able to digest what they meant. And you took it for, what, for how your parents treated you. You believed it as a fact. Yes, I am unworthy. Yes, I'm not smart. Yes, um, I should shut up. I shouldn't say how I feel. I don't deserve love. We believe those things as a kid. There's nobody there to tell us, no, 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 you are smart. You're just not that type of smart. You do deserve love. And here, let me give it to you. So if you don't have that, and you just have what your parents are putting in you, then you go along believing that. So we have to go all the way back to those memories and talk about them and process them. But because you're an adult now and I'm with you when we do it, we're digesting it. 
it's almost like putting a digestive agent into it. Right. You know? And then when you start digesting it, go, oh my God, wait a minute. So like you said, can you rewrite the, can you rewrite it? Yeah, so we rewrite the memory. And then it goes back and we put a new samskara in there. It goes back into your unconscious mind. And then the next time it gets triggered up and now here I am with, a, with another guy. And I'm like, wait a minute, do I want to believe that old thing? You have to, it takes a lot of awareness, but oh, I'm acting small again. Do I want to act that way? Oh, we, we talked about how I could act differently. And I actually have a samskara because samskars are getting made all the time. They're just memories. So now you made a new one of acting confident. You practice that in session. So now that one gets a little stronger each time you act on that one. And each time you don't act on the old one, it gets a little weaker. It's like building new muscles, huh? Yeah, that's right. It reminds me a lot of, um, you know, in Ayurveda, we have like pancha karma, which is like a cleansing process where you go through and it made yes. me think about when you talked about these undigested emotions and a big part of, of, yeah. of pancha karma treatments for cleansing is to help not only process uh, um, physical toxins, but um, um, mental, emotional toxins as well. So it's like kind of a similar way yes. to you process these things and let them move out. Um, yeah, and, that's a good analogy. That's yeah. good analogy. Ayurveda works so well at complementing this type of work. You know, actually, Vedic psychology does include Ayurveda. Hmm. Yeah. Those are one of my questions I had for you. Yeah. Um, before I ask that, though, I am very curious. Do you feel that um, is there a reason why we tend to? So we you talked about these patterns that go back usually to childhood, possibly past lives. If you're into that kind of thing, um, these samskaras and things like that. Um, is there a reason why we tend to? It's almost like we seek these things out is how I see it. You know, it's like we seek out the same relationship yeah. with the same yeah. person over and over, or we seek out, you know, the same dynamic with our parent that we had a hard time with for whatever reason. You know, we, we keep putting ourselves back in this situation that was so traumatizing, yes. so horrible for yes. us. Why the yes. hell are we doing it again? <laughs> you Good know, question. why do we do that? <laughs> Good question. Good question. So, you know, I, I'm a victim of it myself like I just said, with my father, and, and I went through that for 20 years. For 20 years, I could not, I was just banging my head off the wall. So that's another reason why I, I got so into Vedic psychology, because I actually used it to heal myself too. You know, I could not, I, I knew I was doing it. I got to the point where I knew I was doing it, but I would not, I could not be attracted to a nice guy. They gave me like the shivers. Like I just was like allergic to a nice guy. So I only would like a guy who was basically a narcissist, who made me feel like I was unimportant, unworthy, had nothing to say, and I could just serve him and take care of him. Then I felt happy. Not really, but then I felt like all was right in the world. That was my norm. That was my comfort zone, you right. know? So the, so the, why do we keep doing it? Even the, some of us even know, we're like, oh, that's my pattern. And then, then actually sometimes what happens is when you get in it, you're like, no, this, this guy's different, or this girl's different. This person's different. Yeah. This one's different. No, I promise this one's different. So that's, that's the role of ahankar, rationalizing, you know, telling you, no, 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 you're good, you're good, this one's different. But the reason why we do it is those programs that were put into us as a child, those first few years, are your first loves, your first love. So we're all looking for love as adults, right? And love, we have, just imagine you have a little dictionary that's empty when you're a baby, it's empty. So you don't know what love is. And then by how mom treats you, by how dad treats you, you're like, oh, this is love. Okay, being ignored. Not having my feelings met, like validated. Um, being told that I'm weird or I don't fit in, or um, my parent has a bigger issue, so I better be be careful around dad because he's going to be mad, which was my case, you know. So I better not actually ask for anything or say anything or express anything that I need or feel because I'll piss him off, and that's really scary for a little kid, you know. So basically, those programs get put into you literally as your definition of love. For a girl, her first love is her father. So if my dad's acting like that, okay, that's what love is. Th then it gets solidified in my unconscious mind. This is love. Don't express what, how you need, what you need or how you feel because your dad's going to get mad at you. So just be quiet and try not to piss him off. Okay, that's love. So then what happens is, as an adult, you are looking for love. So you know how when people say, oh, it just feels right. Oh, we're like soulmates. I don't want to burst any bubbles, but there's no such thing as a soulmate. I'm sorry to say, but soul is just, you know, it doesn't have all this stuff we're talking about. It doesn't have, there doesn't have a mind. Our mind, there's a mind mate. Your minds connect and that's because of your samskaras. Magnetic attraction means trouble. Sorry to say, most people don't you're like giving, to hear that. You're giving the tough love approach here, huh? <laughs> most people don't like to hear that, but if you're suffering, one, huh? 
<laughs> your ahankar is shaking. But if you're suffering and you've been in painful relationships for a long time, oftentimes you've been in therapy for a long time. And if you don't understand this dynamic, it's hard to get out of it. You know, on Facebook, there's all these codependency groups and people are writing all the same problems all the time, you know, and they can't get out of it. And because you go to therapy and the therapy tells you change your behavior. How do you change your behavior? Okay, you can, it feels superficial. You could say, that's right. I'm going to play hard to get this time. I'm not going to be so easy. Fine, you can try it, but it's like white knuckling it because your program in you makes you attracted to people who don't love you. Right. Why? Because that's how it was as a child. So it's like a magnetic attraction. And so until you understand your program and see it clearly, you know, you're going to keep doing it. You're going to convince yourself, no, no, no. The last guy was like a total business guy. He was completely into his work and he was a workaholic. And that was the problem. But this guy, he's like a yogi. He's so into peace and love like me. No, they both make you feel the same way, like shit. Right, right. So the reason why is because of your, the program and you of what your definition is of love. So I do a lot of work with clients to help figure out. That's good. <laughs> it's hard. It's painful and it's real. And like you said about the panchakarma, this is like, a, you know, what I say to my clients oftentimes when we have a deep, hard session, that it was like an open heart surgery. It's very intense. It's like an open heart surgery doing this work, you know, going in for, for the, uh, getting those old memories out and those painful emotions out. And some people say, but I've been in therapy before and that's what we do. We talk about the painful memories. But what's different here is you understand what the memory is, you understand how it's driving you, and you understand how to get out of it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of education. So you know, oh, just like in the car, that's the gas, that's the brake. Oh, that's the steering wheel. I'm teaching you what's going on and why. It's not just talk about my mom and didn't okay. bash. Them. It's not about bashing your parents. It's right. understanding what they did to put that some scar in you, that program in you that's hurting you. It's not all about, you can be angry at them, that we can process that, but it's not like in, in session, not to their face, but we process stuff. But really what the focus is, is on you and what got put inside of you. And we know, yes, it's not their fault. They didn't mean it. They didn't have good parents. They didn't have, they had a hard life too. Fine. But that's not going to get you out of your problem. Right. So we always have to come back to what's inside of you and how to work on those programs. And I think that's important. That was an important step for me to see too, that I think it's, you know, obviously there's situations if we're talking about home life and who you grew up with and your parents or whoever was taking care of you that, you know, there's very clear instances of, you know, abuse or, you know, bad, bad parenting. And then there's also just because we're human beings and we don't know what the hell we're doing half the time anyway as parents, you know, we just put, and then we put our own crap onto our kids, you know, so, so much of it is also unintentional, which for me helps me realize, you know, we can't, you know, it, it, it relieves some of the blame, I guess, or, or I guess, I guess for me, it puts, it tells me the responsibility is back on me to change yeah. myself. Yeah. You know, I could sit there and say, oh, dad never accepted me or mom, you know, it was never available yeah. or whatever my, my beef is. But unless I'm willing to, you know, make the changes internally, it's just, I, I can stay stuck in that forever, never, 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 never. And it could be really yeah. comfortable for me, but it's never going to actually bring, you know, you know, happiness and true awareness and, and, and the ability yeah. to, to build a, a, a you know, a life that I'm happy with, right? Yeah, that's good. That's hard to do to take responsibility. Yeah. Usually when we first see it, like I have so many clients who come in and say, I had a great childhood. My parents are wonderful. I love them, all this. And I'm like, okay, well, there's something in you that's making you do these dysfunctional things, you know? Yeah. So once we see it, it's not that you can still say, think that you had a great childhood, fine. I'm not saying it's all bad, but you have to see like, dad was not available for me. And if you know dad's story, I'm sure his dad wasn't available for him. So that's fine. Right. But then, like you said, you want to take the you want to take the responsibility for your life at some point. But right. by doing that, you have to see how that impression got made in your heart. Dad wasn't there. My dad, my dad loved me like crazy. So it's not that he's bad. It's just that his father was critical to him. His father was never around and critical. So what and that's because he had his own story. OK, so it's fine. But it still made an impression in my heart. So part of it is getting kind of angry at your parents or whatever those feelings are being hurt by them. But it's not that's not where the buck stops. That's like the first step is really thinking, oh, they weren't there for me in these certain ways I needed. That hurt me. It process your feelings around them not being there. And then now you have to take care of yourself. Right. And say, OK, just let them be free. They, they had their own drama and trauma and all that. But a lot of people in therapy 
especially when we don't when we don't get to the the root right if you're just in general therapy you can go on years just being angry at your parents right without ever which, taking responsibility which was one of my big questions and you know i you know i've talked to so many people and their experience of therapy is you know i mean it was fine but then at a certain point it's like how much more can i talk about mom and dad you know and so they kind of get but it's like people kind of get stuck at that it's like a wall you hit right yeah. And it's to get over that wall is really, really hard and really yeah. takes some like deeper, deeper work to do. Um, yeah. It seems to be a really common stopping point for a lot of people. Is that your experience? Well, not in Vedic psychology. Because <laughs> no, that's why I do Vedic psychology. Because <laughs> <laughs> that that's the starting point. We talk about the parents, we talk about the issues, and then we go to the root. But the nature of the mind, because of Ahankara, right, always wanting to blame someone else because you're a perfected being, right, is always bitching about the parents so if you're not even if the therapist doesn't know about root cause and all that i don't know what techniques there's many techniques out there so i'm sure there's some therapists who've got a way to get to the root and work through it you know but if you end up with a therapist you're just cycling and so you bitch about your parents you complain about your parents the therapist validates you and then the therapist says now do something different you still haven't got out of the fact that you have a program in you that needs to be deactivated right so it's important. Not, you can just talk about them so you so can't yeah. Well, that reminds me a lot. That's a lot like Ayurveda too, right? Like, um, you know, one of the big ways that you treat Ayurveda is to to individualize the treatment to the person and the condition. And and you know, you could have yeah. ten people with headaches, and every you could have ten different treatments for that. You that's know, right. you need to get to the root of what's causing that headache. And if you're just trying to put, you know, stomp it out over here, like a little fire is here, here, and here, you may get some good help with it, but it's not actually going to make it go away or or change in the in a way that's productive. Or if like a bathtub's overflowing you know, and you're kicking a bucket and just filling it with water and putting out the sink instead of just turning off the bathtub, right? You know, it's kind of the yeah. same idea of, of you really have to get to the root of where is this coming from? Why am I doing this? Yeah. Or, um, um, or, you know, what led me to do this rather than just kind yeah. of like, oh, make it stop, make it stop, you know? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I just want to be happy. <laughs> you know, it's easy, right? It's really easy yeah. to want that, and everybody does. But, um, yeah. but it's a lot, lot more work involved in yeah. picking this stuff apart. Um, yeah, because you have to understand you have to understand yourself, and that's a lot of work. No fun either. A lot of times, huh? Yeah, it's very painful because you have to go through those memories again. Right. So that's when, that's when I start using some of these Ayurvedic things, you know, like I use essential oils in my practice and things like that to help people feel calm. And we slowly go in. We don't just go like a deep dive off into the deep end to work on these really painful memories. We kind of move our way into them. Sometimes we work on things you can use in the moment, like the awareness meter to just catch and manage yourself. Maybe use this little essential oil. There's some other techniques like cognitive behavioral therapy techniques to manage in the moment. You catch yourself. And, it's like but, harm reduction, basically, right? <laughs> right? Like what? It's like a harm reduction technique, essentially, yeah. to just keep things okay, which is, which is great and helpful and, and, and yeah. sometimes very necessary, too. But um, that was my next question. Then. Do you... Do you have any um, just kind of real practical stuff that people can do? Like, do, you know, do you work with the sense, you know, in Ayurveda, we work a lot with sensory therapy and that kind of thing. Are there any simple things that are, you know, maybe general, I know you need to see somebody individually um, to really to go deeper, but is there anything that you really like or recommend that's a nice, nice way to work with these things? Well, what I would say is awareness is the main thing right? To become aware of your patterns. And there's ways to do it, if, especially if people aren't ready for therapy yet. You can do things like go, on to, go to a codependency group, you know, that's free. And you can sit there and when you hear everybody else who has a similar issue, you're like, oh, damn. Okay. You know, it helps you see it a lot clearer. clearer. And actually people, some people have a fear of therapy, right? Because you're like bearing yourself, all your insecurities or your vulnerabilities, right? And if you've had a relationship with a parent that broke your trust, right? Or you've had somebody who's maybe sexually or physically abused you as a child, that is going to be really scary to open to, to, to somebody and show. So if you're not ready for that yet, I would say look into some sort of group work, hmm. right? There's like um, Codependence Anonymous, there's Al-Anon, that types of thing. But a lot of people, um, there's even if you're grieving, there's most hospices, like nonprofit hospices will have free grief groups. That's the thing a lot of people don't know about. You know, so it, and grief, it doesn't mean you had somebody had to die now. It could have been they died five, ten years ago and you didn't process the grief because that saying that, um, what is the saying? Time heals all wounds. In Vedic psychology, we don't believe that. Time just helps you 
think of kind of ways to avoid the pain Damn over man. time. The pain is there. It's a samskara that got made. You lost that person. And at some point or another, you, if you want to heal, you have to actually deal with that grief, right? So the way we, if you don't know that, then we think, oh, time heals all wounds. It's going to get better. Oh, you know, it doesn't get better. You just either distract yourself or create situations so you don't have to deal with it. Either you, some people, you know, drink more alcohol. Some people create more drama in their lives, travel more, get a new partner, buy a new house. Like always do something to, to avoid that painful thing. Oh, right. So there's free grief groups you can go to, you know, there's the codependency group, there's Al-Anon. So I'd say group, getting in a group and starting to work on your problem would be one very good step. Um, that helps with the awareness. Another thing is you can, we have a book that we wrote called Daily Deliberations, mm. which is a workbook and it's for 30 days. And every day we, we, we have a different, I'm talking about Babaji, my guru and I, we wrote it together. And every day there's like a different um, small quote of his from some of his lectures, we picked some, some of the quotes that are most like um, practical about the mind. And then there's questions to help you introspect and be like, oh, how does that relate to me? What does that mean? Can you think of a time like that? And what could I do differently in that situation? So it's almost like therapy in a book. If you're not ready yet, for whatever reason, to do therapy, to do Vedic psychology, that daily deliberations book is on his website, which is called jiva, J-I-V-A dot org. Okay. It's called daily deliberation. So that's nice. So that's another way to start raising your awareness, you know, of your mind besides going to group. And how about, I know, I know you're a fan of essential oils and things like that. So, yeah. you know, in Ayurveda, they use, um, you know, the, the nose as being the pathway in a lot of ways for medicines, for the mind and the emotions and things like that. So is that yeah. something that you utilize too with, with um, clients? Yes. Essential yeah. oils are, are in that category of helping in the moment when it's just getting to be too much, you know, mm -hmm. versus getting to, to the root. So essential oils I use with a lot of my clients, even though all of my sessions I do on video. So I have to tell them wherever they are in Germany or wherever they are, okay, go online and order this oil, you know, right. and then because I used to be in Florida and I had an in-person in practice and my room smelled like all the oils and we would use them together. But now it's a little different since I'm in India, but I do use them quite regularly. Um, I'd say in terms of if, if there's any kind of being triggered, the strongest and like most potent one is this peppermint, peppermint essential oil. Mm. So I use that. I have it right here, <laughs> you know, and you can just actually put one or two drops in your palm of your hand and you can then go like this to make your own little uh, inhaler type of thing. You know, and then you cover it and you breathe, you put it over your nose and you mm. just take some nice, a few, maybe three to five deep breaths in of that peppermint oil. And it very quickly can change your mood. So that's a nice way in the moment. If you're triggered, it works really well with, um, with any kind of hot emotion, like anger, frustration, mm. you know, um, if your anger gets too high, it, it's not going to work. But if you feel it at the beginning when you first start feeling, I'm annoyed, I'm feeling really, you know, then you do it. But if you're like pissed, you're gonna have to do something physical, like a run or, or push ups or something to get it out. Um, but peppermint works also with um, any type of thing where you're, where you need to like change your mind, anxiety, you're feeling anxious, you just breathe that in, it's cooling, and kind of calming. You can also put a drop of, or two of lavender in there with the peppermint. Mm. You know, lavenders, they're even using it in hospitals now for um surgery they have they put a little drop of lavender in a cotton ball and they have the patient smell it before surgery and then they have they have them smell it after surgery and it's it's uh really shortening the recovery time after surgeries just la just i, I wonder too if that might in some way affect you know surgeries of trauma yeah. if in some way it might help to mitigate you know the, the effects of of that too maybe you know with the lavender especially it's interesting yeah yeah so essential oils are really powerful. And some people use them already, which is wonderful. And then I just bring them into the practice and I incorporate them into the practice because some of the work I also do relates to the body. In other words, where are you actually feeling the emotion in your body? You know, if you're feeling sad, some people feel tightness in their throat, mm. their, chest, their heart's constricting, something like that. So we'll use the oil and put it right there. Put it right here or put it mm. here. Incorporate it into the work we're doing while we're talking about the trauma. Or the painful emotions. And how does, I have a couple of random questions. How does um, 
do you do, I mean, do you deal with past lives and things like that with Vedic psychology or is that like kind of outside the realm of, I mean, does it matter even? I mean, I've also heard that, you know, essentially, you know, past lives are just more things we've done at some point in time and to get too wrapped up in it is not always helpful, although maybe entertaining, but I mean, is that something you try to dissect out as well or is that not, not, not such a big part of it? The past lives, the way I look at it is that oftentimes when people come and they're into past lives and they're like, oh, I want, you know, I had a past life reading and I was like this, or, you know, I, I think that I'm like this because of my past life. To me, it's interesting because like I said, you came in with some vasanas, with some tendencies to be certain ways, you know, but at the same time, it's not the main thing. So we incorporate everything. That's, that's nice and interesting. But the main thing is you had programs in this life, hmm. which are hurting you. So let's get that through that first and then see what happens. <laughs> Got enough to deal with in the here and now, huh? So, you know? And so it's also some sort of, uh, um, what's the right word? Like a avoidance tactic. Mm -hmm. People come in, they will want to talk all about their past life. And then the past, I was like this and he was like this or she was like this. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. But what's happened in this life? You were abused. Right. Let's process that. So it's not that it's not interesting, but I would use, the way I would use past lives is more for, this is a really deep tendency of yours, so it must be really hard to get rid of because maybe you've been doing this for many lives. Right. You know? The other way we could use it is, you know, a part of the Vedic psychology is focusing also on people's strength. So it's, in other words, knowing your nature and, okay, you're, the, you're a pitta type, so you're, like, you know, smart and you're focused, and that's a good thing. So especially when people are feeling down because we're working on some very painful parts, the past life can come through and say, yes, you know, I know you don't feel like you know what you should do with your life right now, but you have this really strong tendency to be loving to people. It's just that you pick the wrong people to be loving to. Mm. So that tendency is probably coming from the past, right? Because you always want to help. So that's a beautiful tendency. Let's use that in the way where it's can feel, you know, not painful for you. It can feel, um, you feel good. You feel confident. You feel better when you help because you're not getting smashed by the person. Right. or used or by them, you know? Right, right. And this is kind of going back to something a little earlier that I wanted to just clarify my question about. Um, when I was asking like, why do we do these things? Why do we go back to these same dumb patterns? Do you feel that maybe there's some piece of that that's, I mean, I don't even know what part of the, the soul, maybe it's the soul, I don't know the Atma, um, is trying to heal these problems. So it keeps kind of thrusting you back in these situations. Like, do you think there's something to that maybe? Yeah. Like, I mean, aside from it just being a bad idea, you know, to keep chasing the same partner who does the same thing that didn't work for you last time. I mean, there, I just wonder if there's some flip side to it, you know, where it's like something's trying to heal and you're trying to, you know, maybe reestablish your relationship with your parents or whoever, you know, I don't know. No, there's definitely, no yeah. that's a good way to look at it. Josh. That's a good way to look at it. And it's a positive way. And it's the way you can grow from it. So it's not like we don't want to think, oh, I'm so stupid. Why do I keep picking the same abusive relationship right why am i so oh i can't figure it out i know my we don't want to bash ourselves right so actually this is the way to look at it is to say you know what i keep picking the same type of person who's hurting me the same type of situation the same type of relationship why because it's my karma what does karma mean it's coming from my past it's something deep that i need to work through like we get in these karmic relationships where we're, where we're locked in Right, and it's so painful. That's a sign that that means it is something you need to work through, and that's why you're trying to go for it. You're driven to go for your karma. You know, if you think of how many people you see in a given year, it's probably thousands. Just walking through an airport or walking through a mall, you know, there you see thousands of people. But why are there only a few that really get your goat, that you really can't get out of your mind, or that you love so much? That's your karma. You have karmic agreements with these people to work through it, you know? So you, and if somebody's being abusive to you in this life, most likely you probably weren't ni that nice to them in a past life. Because karma spread out over time, we don't see the thing that we did to cause this. Mm -hmm. Karma has the reaction. So like, you know, if I slap you in the face, then you're gonna slap me back. That's immediate, that's my karma, right? But there's other karma that happened 10 lifetimes ago. And now here you have this partner who's being abusive to you. It's not, it's not that you're some really nice saintly person who never did something to that person. That's your karma. So this is helpful to look at it like that. Number one, I'm in this, like you said, I'm drawn to this to heal. Yes, definitely. And two, it's my karma, meaning 
there's something I did to create this in the past. And now it's uh, manifesting, the karma is manifesting. And the best way to get out of it is look at it, see my pattern clearly, and then respond in a way that I'm not creating more karma with that person. Hmm. That's the work. Healing, right. That's the karmic healing and the personal yeah. healing, right? Yeah. It's beautiful. Because, yeah, because then we do a lot more things usually to get hooked. We react, even if we do nothing to them. If we start freaking out and start if, you know, getting angry, sad, depressed with that person, we can be sure we're gonna see them again because we haven't worked through it. <laughs> and a lot of times we don't wanna see them again, right? So the best way is to figure out how in your mind to work through it, understanding this is your karmic kind of contract with them. And the best way to work through it is understand what I must have done to create that and then take responsibility for your part. And then you can feel peaceful about that person. You might even feel bad, like, God, if they're hurting me this month, much, what the hell did I do to them last time? Right. right. That's how I see when I get in a situation with someone who's being like abusive to me. I'm, now that I understand karma and past lives, I'm like, oh, wow, I must have done something pretty bad for this person to be like this to me. So I better be extra nice to them, not in a codependent way, you know, but in a. It's a big distinction to make, huh? Yeah. A kindness, keep the peace, respectful. Way, but also keep my boundary right yeah and I think that's something that um and I, I myself have certainly felt confused about it too but it seems sometimes when we talk about karma and things like that it it, it can also leave room for kind of bad and things to be okay which shouldn't be okay you know right. but 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 there's you know good boundaries are also you know important too and 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 that's also can be maybe the karma is that you needed to make better boundaries. Not that's just right. you should let somebody, you know, slap you in the face or whatever it is, you know, yeah. or screw you over or, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's a, 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 a distinction that to make. Yeah. Because sometimes we say, oh, that's just my karma. Right. And Easy. people say that all the time. Oh, that's just my karma. Oh, well. No, it's like, oh, that's my karma. I better figure out what I can do in this situation to equalize it, to be, so I can be peaceful about it. Right. Right. So if I understand, okay, there's something I must have done to, in the past that created this, this is manifesting. How can I deal with it current in the current? So I'm not entangled with that person anymore or that situation. You know, so I'm peaceful. <laughs> like you said, maybe make better boundaries. What? It's a big question. Yeah, it's a hard question. And it, it takes a lot of digging. No, I mean, I have a big question now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Are relationships even possible? <laughs> <laughs> Is that the end of this? If we get to the end, it's like, yeah, just just go to the bathroom and like, you know, just just stop trying that. <laughs> so relationships are important. You know, we, if you think about it, why do we even come into this life and this being, you know, for love? Right. And you can only have love. You can't have it with a rock, right? So you can only have love in relationships. And we're all trying for it. Even the person who's the most like horrible person to you, they're actually trying to get love. They just don't know how to do it, right? And same with us. When we do things, we're like, why do I do that? Or why did I say, we're actually trying to get love. So relationships are so important. And that's the only way to work through your karma. You can't wall yourself off in a room and, and work through your karma. You have to engage, you know? So relation and, and re, re, engaging is how we kind of polish the diamond, you know? Right. Right. To polish yourself, you have to get rubbed. Right. And then the trick is to say, oh, okay, it's not you, it's me. They don't need to know that, but you have to say, it's me. So what does that mean? What's bothering me? Why am I trying to control that person, criticize that person, uh, get too close to that person? What is it within me? But yeah, that, relations that was something you and I have talked about, you know, when I've worked with you too. And, and that was huge for me, huge, huge piece to recognize, you know, is seeing what am I doing? You know, yeah. <laughs> what did I do? What am I responsible for? <laughs> what? And it hurts and it sucks and it's ugly. And, but it's such a relief when you can like get to that point of being able to do it and move on and let go. And, it, and you just even release a, a lot of your own anger and your own hurt. You know, a lot of it, it, it actually makes you feel more free and, and better <laughs> in the long run, you know? Right? It, yeah, it's, it's really helpful. But then it becomes a habit. Then you get used to it saying, okay, what am I doing to kind of create this person to act like that in that way? Or to create myself feeling bad again? What am I doing? 
and right. it, then it starts becoming a habit. You start getting used to asking those questions and, and figuring yourself out, you know, but it's really hard. It's really hard to do it because you're not used to it. Right. It's so easy to be like, oh, she's such a, and then I have some clients who say, yeah, but it, you're telling me to, I have to take responsibility. I have to look at myself, but isn't it true that he really is a jerk, right? And I'm like, okay, fine. He's a jerk, but that's not going to change you getting better. Right. You know, because they'll say, but wait a minute, if I'm all taking responsibility for myself, then he's never going to admit that what a jerk he is, that he cheated on me. He's never going to take, and it's like, okay, whether he does or doesn't, you still have a program in you that's right. making you a cheater, right? So both are true. Yes, he cheated on you, and yes, that's not fair, and yes, he's a jerk, fine. But now let's leave it there. Same thing with the parents. So what you said is, is, a, is a very potent point of taking the responsibility and owning your side of it. And that's how you get out of your karma. Mm. Then you know you're out of it when you see the person and you're kind of not feeling so triggered by them. You're like, oh, okay. I, you know, I, and the more you can see yourself and your issues, you can see, oh, you actually start having compassion for other people. Even the people that hurt you, you're like, oh God, they're really struggling too. I just never saw it because I was so triggered by my own mm. pattern. But they're actually, to act like that, they're actually hurting too. Mm. So they, you know, that's sad. Right. And I just, yeah, it makes me wonder too, what a powerful lesson that must be. If you're able, if you're lucky enough that your parents are still alive or whoever that person was, you know, who originally kind of caused some of these wounds, if you're able to make that healing with them, you know, too, right? That's gotta be huge. Yeah. yeah. Oftentimes the healing is done in therapy. In other words, it's never done with the parent to their face or to the person who hurt you because that person once you get into this type of work especially the vedic psychology it's very deep and, you, and there's very big transformational change so you're changing but then you expect the other person to change too so then you go and you say oh i'm sorry or can i talk about when this happened they don't want to talk about it they're still back where you were a few years ago right so the healing actually comes in the therapy through the realizations and sometimes even through different therapeutic techniques like pulling up a chair and saying let's bring dad's energy in what would you say to him? Mm. Because it's, sometimes it's really disappointing when you're healing and feeling so good and then you want to go talk to your dad and he's at the same place he was when you were a kid. And then you get triggered all over again. Right. Get sucked right back in in an instant, huh? Yeah. So the healing comes from with you and you, within you, not with the other. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what time are we? Yeah, it's already, it's already eight. Went so fast. I can talk about this all night. Um, so I know that you work with clients one on one, and if somebody wants to work with you, how do they? How do they get in touch with you, or how do they book a session? How does that work? So I have a, a website called Jessica Richmond Therapist dot com. We could maybe put it on the Facebook. Yeah. So, so on there it says book an appointment. You can click that. You have to book an appointment right there, request an appointment. Um, or you can email me at jessrichie108 at gmail.com. Maybe we can put my email too. People want that. And what I would say is if you're interested to try one session and just see how it feels, you know, because sometimes therapy is so scary and you have to have a connection with the therapist and not everybody's going to connect with everybody, you know. So, and also the other thing that's unique about Vedic psychology, which is different, is that I see a lot of people who are not who are not totally traumatized, who haven't been abused, who are Ayurvedic practitioners, who are I see psychotherapists. I actually even had a guru who is my client. So I I help people who are pretty well adjusted and healthy. I'm not just helping you if you're totally going through a really hard time. I do help those types of people as well. But Vedic psychology is for anybody who has a mind. If you have a mind, it'd be a good idea to know it. Right. <laughs> Right. So it's not that you have to be struggling. It could be that you're just interested in understanding the dynamics of your mind and what some scars you've got going that are your programs. You know, so that's one point. And the other point is I offer a Vedic psychology certification training hmm. course for anybody in the healing profession or anybody who just wants to know it. I even train some business people on that who aren't in the healing profession. So I offer a course like one on one where I train over 16 sessions on video. Um, on what I kind of briefly talked about today, the parts of the mind and how they work. So by the time you're done with that, you will know the parts of your mind, not in a therapeutic sense, like you haven't gone into it 
for your own self, but you understand the philosophy, the theory, and the parts of the mind. And we analyze different case studies that I have. You know, I was curious so, about that too, because I know some people here are going to be, um, you know, either either practitioners in one form or another, therapists. So you can also yeah. go through a course with you too and learn these skills and this skill set. And oh, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah, we call it um, Jiva. Jiva's, you know, my my um, guru's ashram mm -hmm. is called Jiva, and so it's it's called Jiva Vedic Psychology Certification Level One. Because cool. then we have other le levels for the practitioners when we start working with your clients. And is that something you can do? I mean, do you have to come to India to do this? Or do you do this online or both? Or how does that work? It's online. And it's, six, it's 16 hours. And you can book the sessions how you want. It's 16 hours of training. So you can choose if you want to book it. Most people book it once a week for an hour with me. Okay. Great. But it's, one person. It's, it's individual. Like if you wanted to start next week, you can go on and book it. I mean, you have to email me and we'll set it up, but. <clears throat> okay, great. And we were, um, we've been talking about maybe bringing Babaji in in a couple of weeks too, and maybe doing something a little more, you know, some other things as well, maybe probably end up at the same subjects that everybody wants to talk about, love and mom <laughs> <laughs> and dad. But, yeah. um, it's very interesting to hear how he talks about love. Yeah. So yeah, um, so keep an eye out on that. I think we're talking about in two weeks, right? Maybe yeah. same time, two yeah. Sundays from now. So yeah. hopefully we'll, we'll put something up online very soon yeah. for anybody interested in that. Um, yeah. And yeah, everybody, I, I can't recommend Jesse enough. She's great if, you, if you're looking for somebody to see and want a different angle than maybe what you're used to with um, Western therapy. It's so helpful, so awesome. Um, and yeah. Anything else you want to say when I'm finished oh, with? Thank you very much yeah, for asking all the good questions. Yeah, it was a very fun conversation. I enjoyed it. Yeah. So, okay. Well, I know it's morning there for you, so enjoy your <laughs> day, and I'm going to be enjoying my evening and getting ready for bed. Yeah. Have a good night. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. Bye. Bye.